wait for the jingle to end, you know. <laughs> well, Gia, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I was here two days ago for the real estate event. I'll be here tomorrow for the travel event. Brazil is an exciting place to me. I've been here 12 times in the last five years, and I realize a lot of changes that are happening here. And I was looking at uh, yesterday a couple of facts. You probably already know that uh, the per capita income in Brazil has doubled in the last 10 years. And 20 million people have been added to the mid-level of society, whatever that means, right? But, of course, the bus fares have gone back to normal, which is also good. But Brazil is an interesting place because if you consider, for example, what happened in Turkey when people had a problem with the local the building on a park that they wanted to keep, the prime minister of Turkey said that these people are using social media as a menace, a disease. And, and th these people are essentially terrorists, you know, they're the ones protesting. While here in Brazil, the same thing happened. What happened? We have a giant conversation about all these things, and, and uh, it's completely different, the reaction to what people are doing with media and technology. Not to say that the problem is solved by just having a conversation. You know better than, than I do what that means. But basically what we're seeing here is I think it's a really, really important distinction is how you embrace and use technology. Technology is a key driver of prosperity. Everybody knows that, and this is why all governments, of course, are interested. 10% of broadband brings 1% growth of GDP, and that's a global fact. It will probably end eventually, you know, can't go on forever. But an interesting stat. So um, today I'll talk to you about the future of technology and where, what's coming. Uh, you can find my slides later on at uh, futurewithgerd.com, my website, Gerd Cloud, which is a place where you can download all of my free books and today's presentation is a Dropbox folder and of course on my YouTube channel. So what is a futurista, a futurista? Okay. I am not going to give you a prediction of the future. I'm not going to give you a recipe how to make lots of money in the future. I wish I knew I would do it myself. Uh, I will try to, uh, to sort of touch the future with you to understand what's coming in three to five years and I think uh, there's a great Chinese saying that says, if you want to know the future, ask your children. And it's very true, because we're so busy looking at other stuff, like you know, how to pay tomorrow's bill, uh, that we don't look at the future. And that is a mistake. Right? Because if we don't take time to look at what's coming, you know, not 50 years from now, but three to five years from now, we can't get ready. And the speed, as you know, here in Brazil, right, especially, the speed is mind-boggling. The speed is increasing, it's not slowing down. The noise is increasing. The traffic, of course, is increasing. Right. So I will try to share some of those trends with you. Here's the video. The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. So if what I say now seems to you to be very reasonable, then I'll fail completely. Only if what I tell you appears absolutely unbelievable, have we any chance of visualizing the future as it really will happen. So this is a guy, Arthur C. Clarke, 1941. I didn't get to meet him, unfortunately. But I'm going to try to be unreasonable with you today. I don't think it's about thinking about the future only. It's about feeling the future. Understanding means more than this part of the brain saying, you know, I can run the spreadsheets and know what to do. That's not true. Understanding goes beyond that. So. We have a saying with my company, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. When you look at the publishing business, the music business, it was quite clear 10 years ago it was going to rain. Right? Are they building an ark? Are you building an ark for companies? And we do this for many companies around the world, this sort of ark building exercise. So first point, we're moving into a completely digital society. Marshall McLuhan, the great philosopher, called this the global village. In fact, he was talking 1971 about Facebook and about Google Plus and about Orkut and about QQ and Weibo and Twitter, the global village. In a global village, you don't have peace and harmony and quiet, he said. You have considerable chaos and crossover of conversations. That's just part of a global village. So now we have to rethink when everything becomes digital, our movies, our advertising, our music, our money, our education, our health records. Some very scary stuff there, of course. As we know, 
I'll talk about that a little bit later, we have to re rethink how we do business. We are no longer in a power position. If you were a telecom company, some of you are, have the pleasure of being involved with telecommunications. Ten years ago, you could do whatever you want. Nobody could complain, you just cut them off. Right? I mean, in Switzerland, where I live, Swisscom was a state company, there was no competition, result was we paid the highest telecommunication prices in the world until four years ago. So now we have to rethink the digital default really means everything has to be looked at with a digital native approach. You know, starting with the internet, the internet like water, like electricity, like air. This is where we're going in five years. The internet will be just as available as air. Hopefully in Brazil as well. So we have, as part of this, the total convergence of devices, of media, of telecom, and of social. So if you're in the telecom business, you're in the media business. If you're in the media business, you're in the device business. Right? You're sitting together. If you're involved with YouTube, what business are you in? Are you in the search business? Are you in the media business? Are you in the advertising business? It's interdependent, and we have things like social television, where people are interacting with the television and with the producers and other, other viewers through a second screen device. It's a fantastic opportunity for television companies to get closer to the user. In fact, I think this is the saving grace for television, that you can actually interact at the same time. So, everything that we know, pretty much everything, is becoming ICT, information communications technology, or content. Doctors, using the Watson computer to diagnose patients as they make the rounds, running right next to them on a the little stand, having access to two billion cases, using the phone to connect, digital money, Bitcoin, currencies, digital distribution, logistics, digital green sustainability with measuring. Everything is becoming digital and connected. I am not referring to the absolute, infinite concept of universal peace and goodwill, of which some fantasies and fanatics dream. Let us focus instead on a more practical, more attainable peace. This will require a new effort, a new context for world discussions. It will require increased understanding, and increased understanding will require increased contact. So let us not be blind to our differences but let us also direct attention to our common interests, our most basic common link, is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Now, this world is imminent. The world where everybody is connected. And I'm not saying there will only be benefits. I mean, clearly we have addiction and we have you know, data security and privacy. But when the world is connected and we can do things differently and there are substantial benefits that come from this, I think it's really important that we get Brazilians connected at low cost as quickly as possible. I mean, look at the complaints that you have about Brazilian infrastructure. You know, that problem needs to be solved. I've suggested many times in the past in other countries that the internet should be tax-free for that reason. So just something to think about. A big opportunity that's also coming along with this is this interface of humans and machines. Again, also a scary topic, but think about this for a second. Artificial intelligence sounds fancy, right? When you're using Google Now or Google Maps, it uses artificial intelligence to predict what's happening because it has your data. When you go to Amazon to buy a book, Amazon says, buy this book, it's also good. That's artificial intelligence. Right? So, but when we think this through in the next five years, we're going to have this thing called big data, which is you know, powerful streams of data coming together to define things and to give us intelligence in real time. Very powerful tools. I think they're going to drive economies. We're going to see interface revolutions, from typing on the computer to talking to Siri or to the Google search engine, or to anything, voice control, or Samsung TV, to blinking, like a jet fighter pilot, right, to thinking. We're going to think and search. 
or blink and search. That, that is the future. I mean, Ray Kurzweil, the singularity uh, leader, has an interesting quote. Search engines won't wait for, for you to ask for information. They will know you like a friend. Now, this is a challenge. Huh? I want them to know me like a friend, but not like a surveiller. So there's a, there's a challenge that, how do we do this? But the benefit of that is you know, that we have a tremendous technology available to us that is going to blur the boundaries between do we really want to go inside with this? So I'll leave you that, that uh, question for a little bit later. But what is happening today is that these bubbles here are driving the entire future of business, technology, media, telecom, communications, anything based on big data, what I call data is the new oil, you've heard this before, I hope, I'll talk more about that later, but all the neighboring th things, intelligence, software, artificial intelligence, robots, next generation interfaces, the Internet of Things. Sounds all like science fiction, it's all already here. All the cars that we buy now will be connected to the Internet by default in the very near future. All the televisions are on the Internet connected in the near future. So that generates a huge amount of possibilities and of course of, uh, also of conflicts. The other day I was at my doctor and I was uh, waiting to go in and I was, I was searching for what he said that I had and I came across some very interesting information about Chinese herbal medicine. Right? And I tell my doctor about this and my doctor says, what are you talking about? I'm the doctor. <laughs> huh? But he was a young guy so he got it. You know, I, I, we talked about it and he took it in. But many doctors are not happy with this. It's a question of authority. When you take an online certificate at, at the Khan Academy for, for programming, are you, are you equal with an MIT guy? Probably not, but you've learned something. So many, many issues that arise from technology. And I think really what I would like you to think about today is not about change, because change is good, right? but about transformation, like this. Becoming a different company, becoming a different person. Granted, of course, a person is probably easier than a company. But what we need is to think about what is needed next, because it's very likely that most of what you do in five years, at least half of it will be reinvented. I'll give you some examples. This transformation is mind-boggling. If you're not ready for transformation, not just change, it'll run you over. And Brazil is the first place where this is going to happen because of the speed, the number of people, and demographics. You here in this room are at least 10 to 15 years younger than the same audience I have in Europe on the same topic. Okay? That will show you how quicker this will happen here. Take this slide, what happened to people who make computers. There's computer manufacturers and distributors in this room, right? What do people buy now? Look at this graph. They buy tablets. Right? Talk about transformation. This is death, not just transformation. Right? This is very difficult. How do people use television and visual media? I mean, it's exploding. Right? Online video is just mind-bogglingly exploding. Over-the-top video. Do you really need cable television? I leave you to answer this question, but you know, at home, I don't need it. My wife wants to keep it because she wants to go through the channels. <laughs> but I, you know, I've got access to anything I want through paid and free and whatever means. Right? I, don't, I go over the top. So there's a lot of questions here. We're going to see the great uncoupling of traditional couple, uh, couples that were uh, strung together by computing and computers. We don't need computers to do computing. We can speak into the cloud. Right? It will come back with something. We don't need media companies for content. Well, we, we need them, of course. We need them. But we don't just need them to get content. We can get content other ways. Google isn't really a media company, but there are lots, there's lots of content there. Right? We need creators to get the content, of course. Do we need mobile operators for phone calls? Well, for now we do. Right? But we will have phones without SIM cards that run on, on local area networks. Do we need them? I think we need them, of course. But there's a substantial change here that we're looking tell. Do we need cable and satellite to watch TV? We can use the internet. That doesn't mean that they are superfluous, they're not. And you know, I used to be in the music business as a producer and then later on on the internet. Basically, music companies is a, make a great example. We still need record labels and publishers, um, but completely in a different position, not in the old position. 
So very similar situation here. We have a global transformation driven by digital society. And if Marshall McLuhan was still alive, he would have a good laugh, or George Orwell would have a, uh, a cry, probably. But um, what's happening here is that we're moving from products to services to experiences. Okay. From the old-fashioned desktop to the tablet to Google Glass. Google Glass is not about computers. It's about an experience. No matter what you think about Glass and other implications of it, it shows the way to computing being completely behind the scenes and not being necessarily connected to hardware. Telephone, okay. my friend Michael Douglas with the first mobile phone. Okay. Right. Moving on to, of course, the next generation, bundles, where music is bundled. That's a service, music bundled with the phone, as they have in many countries around the world, like TDC in Denmark. And in the end, basically, the mobile experience becomes completely superfluous, disconnected from stuff. Sony said five years ago at the Consumer Electronics Show that Sony is not in the business of selling stuff. And you know, Sony sells stuff, right? But what do they do? They are shifting to services and to experience. So I would maintain for you, if you're in the business of making stuff, devices, right, your next business is services and experience layered into the stuff. That's what Samsung is doing. Samsung people in this room, I think. Right? Samsung is not going to be satisfied with making boxes. Right? There's a, a big step coming after that. So Peter Drucker, a great management guru, says the greatest thing to do in times of change and turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but to act with yesterday's logic. Of course, it's impossible to know tomorrow's logic doesn't exist, right? You have to create tomorrow's logic. When Jeff Bezos invented the Kindle, he didn't go out and say, well, people are going to give me a lot of money for the Kindle. Nobody asked for it. He spent eight million billion dollars of subsidies to build the Kindle, and now everybody around the world has Kindle more or less, but half of the books, or more than half, that he sells are now electronic. That's next logic. So I'll give you some examples here. Music business, the worst case, there is no logic not a current or a future logic. Right? <laughs> it's basically just uh, going backwards. Newspapers. Okay. Television trying to protect content so that you don't create the next logic. Right? You stay with the current logic if possible. So videos aren't made available. Right? The whole idea of saying, OK, Turkey, we talked about that, the menace to society, and advertising. Advertising as yelling. Interruption, noise, that's yesterday's logic. We're talking about a trillion dollars here, I and mean, we're not talking about small change. Advertising is global, $620 billion, and then you have public relations and marketing, roughly a trillion dollars. So you're going to see a budget shift of at least half away from the yelling, you know, from, from the yelling and, and disruption, and I think this is a really great uh, turf for advertising agencies. And yesterday's logic is this idea of captive prison customers. Telecoms are very good at this. Right? Or they were, you know, that's not. Right? Media companies are fantastic at this. I mean, how are you going to watch the football game if you don't have cable? Right? You have to try to find somebody to work on the cable for you, right? as they do sometimes here in Brazil, I hear. But having captive customers, I mean, what kind of idea is this? In the digital society, how are you going to capture people? It's impossible, because there's always a way around your fence. So if you're going to rely on, on capturing, capturing people and this military language of marketing, you know, target acquisition, and you know, that's yesterday's logic. You have to engage. I mean, that, that is the difference. Looking at Red Bull, uh, at Nike, at Fiat here in Brazil with their campaigns, at Unilever, you know, engaging. So, in the telecom world, my friend Martin Geddes, you know, is a very smart guy, talks about this. He talks about the telecom world and the over-the-top, the OTT world, right? The world that most of kids live in. <laughs> uh, for example, using WhatsApp or Viber or so rather than using SMS, right? That's the over-the-top world and, and what WhatsApp has 240 million users now. Maybe Google is interested in that. But so looking at this world, he says basically what's going on is that it's going from technology, from network roaming, to experience roaming. Right? And the, the difference really is this, right? Any combination, any experience, any platform, 
that is the world that we're going into. That's not to say that the world of networks and building stuff and infrastructure is going away. It's not. You know, if there was no infrastructure, we couldn't be going over the top. So it's clearly going to stay there as well. But we have to take a leap. We work with over 100 companies around the world, and the biggest problem is this. When do you take a leap? When you know there's water in the lake. You don't jump into an empty pool. So there's, there's something there that's attractive. But also, sometimes it takes some pain. You know, somebody's pushing you off the board. It takes both. This is very important, I think, for the future. The iPhone is now generating half of the revenue of Apple, 60%. The Kindle is, didn't exist six years ago, is now a huge profit center for Amazon. LinkedIn, you guys are all on LinkedIn, made something like, what, $850 billion, million dollars last year? Connecting us didn't exist six years or seven years ago. So think about this for a second. The majority of your revenues, sorry, in 2018 will result from things that don't even exist today. And those things we have to find. Maybe that's your mission today, okay, to find out what is that going to be in five years. And whether you're a handset manufacturer or a computer company or a telecom network or a media company, that's something you have to look at. Because we used to live in this nice bubble, the protected world of technology and telecom. Nobody could get in unless they paid. That world is gone. Now we're entering, we're coming to the end of protected spaces. You know, the consumer is kicking our butt with technology and social media. So we're, we're, we're watching the end of this. Media first, telecom next, devices and hardware, banking and money. Digital money will completely redo banking. Now think about that for a second. In Africa, the biggest provider of transactions for banking is not the banks, it's the telcos and the startups with mobile money called M-Pesa. So the end of those spaces is near. Brazil is the fastest country in the world in terms of increase of connectivity. Number one, in terms of change, how, how many people go online at what speed. Not in terms of quality yet, but I think Brazil is right before the takeoff point. The pivot point to the digital society. So that's, to me, it's a fantastic opportunity. And uh, on top of that, Brazil is also number one in terms of how people engage with the medium. As you can see in this chart, a little bit hard to see. I'll zoom in here on the Brazil part. Brazil has a top rating for doing all the stuff that people do on the web, access additional content online, interact in real time, use social networks, vote for things. It's all happening here as a leader of all developing countries. So if you're advertising in print or radio, think again. Okay? There is a reason you're doing this, of course, because there's a mass audience. But now you have a highly targeted <coughs> audience that's completely niche and completely targeted, I think this is really becoming interesting. So our world is now moving in a yin-yang kind of way. There is no such thing as a separation of physical and digital. Right? Doesn't exist. There is no offline. It's in our head. We're offline if we go in the country because, of course, there's no 3G, right? Or even here, <laughs> if there's no 3G. But that's temporary. Okay? The future will be offline as a mental state complete convergence of physical and digital, cyberspace and meat space, as they call it. Our society, society is going in this direction at a mind-boggling speed, and we have to be ready for this. Mobile, real-time, always on. And again, let me quantify this. I'm not saying this is all great. That's not. Right? There are lots of issues, and we have to learn that responsibility, which I'll talk about later. But this is where it's going. We have to change our business practices. We have to change our lifestyles. We have to change how we propose businesses. And the, mo and the movie industry, for example, that used to do this, which is to hide the films as much as possible so that we were forced to buy DVDs that didn't work here. Uh, the movie industry is now changing tech on a global scale and going from this idea of protection to the idea of engagement. And I can guarantee you, in the media business, protection will not make you any money. It's guaranteed. Watch the music business. Right? It's engagement that makes money. And how do you engage? I mean, this, of course, in a digital society is about this. There's two things about this. If you're in the tech business, you're in the trust business. That's what it comes down to. People will give you their data. 
They will give you their money. They'll buy your devices. They'll do all these things. If you mess with their trust, you're dead. This goes for all of us, of course, and also for advertising. I mean, of course, if you, if you fly a plane and it doesn't work, you crash, right? But if you work with a company that leaks your data, I mean, if Facebook would leak our data you know, rampantly around, we'd leave, be dead. So if you're in the tech business, you're in the trust business. Think about that when you do marketing. The only reason that people will buy your devices is because they trust you. There is a small reason that your device is also good. But it's really about brand, about trust. We have to reimagine our world of business uh, going away from what I call an, e an ego system, a top-down system that is driven by one person, see Apple, rest in peace, to an ecosystem, right? a world that creates business models that are interdependent, that are interconnected. We have to reimagine telecom and technology. The content owners and the content producers are not the enemies of technology, and vice versa. Right? They belong together because they're, they're on the same ecosystem. Device makers, content, advertising, telecoms, interdependence. If you refuse interdependence, you won't exist. Because you're just one, that one lonely tree over here that's going to die. It's about figuring this out, how it works together. So very important here, I think, to think about the future of this, it's essentially this cycle, very important cycle of the top red level media entertainment and content and the lower level technology completely intertwined. So when you think about the future of what happens in your business, no matter whether you're in content or media or telecom, it is in the collaboration with others where the business model is being created. You live in these silos from the old world, you know, I'm a content guy, you're the Google guys, and you're the tech guys, and you're the ad agency, and you know, it's all nice, you're organized, won't work. Our silos are game over. And you see this happening across the industry. If you're an ad agency, you know what this means. You're no longer gonna just spend your clients' money on just getting a bunch of people together to run your ads and get a discount. That's over, so it's guaranteed failure. Telecoms in Europe, take a good look at this one. Guaranteed decrease in ARPU and average revenue per user and in revenues, SMS will be lost sooner or later due to over-the-top media. Brutal decline. So you have to think about this. You have to think about the future being a larger story. You have to move up the food chain. Devices, content, connectivity belong together. And I think this is what we have to think about for the next couple of years to figure out where this will be going. Time to move up that food chain, not to just ride the one that you have. I can't tell you how many telecoms that I work with. I work with over 100. Uh, my team works with, I work with about 20 myself, including Singapore Telecom and, and many others. How many times they say, you know what, we're just going to sell connectivity, our SIM cards, and we'll just make money charging people. Well, that's great, but it's going to end. It's not enough. You have to take it a step further. Look at this research saying the biggest drivers of growth in content consumption, first uh, international uh, CEOs of media companies saying the first one is mobile devices, including smartphones and tablets. That's the biggest driver. What is the second? Improving broadband. I mean, it's obvious. And the business model is amazing. Think about five billion people connected by, the, by, by 2020 and the opportunities arising from this. In newspapers, we have learned already that the way to generate value is not to say that you know, we have to put a paywall, put a coin in to get inside of the website, like the New York Times does. It's not really working, how, however nice it is. We have to think of all of the values, all of the things that a newspaper does, you know, basically figuring out this idea of added values. Having great content, having a strong mobile network, having a great hardware is no longer enough. You have to add value, you have to find a way of saying, okay, take this example, The Economist, the only newspaper I've, I subscribe to with money, not with attention. I pay a hundred bucks a year, not because I like their writing, I like their writing, but I wouldn't pay for that, straight out, because I can listen to it in the car. It allows me to listen to the magazine as an audio track. That's called added value. And that's really what we have to look for. 
In fact, I would maintain that most of your businesses will focus on added value and the core becomes just a given. It's just there. Don't ask people to pay for the core as much as for the other reason to buy, which are the added values. I mean, this is something that we see pretty much across all industries. Look at the telecom business on the left. A lot more people, that is the red line, using over-the-top uh, SMS and messaging like Twitter and WhatsApp and so on. On the right, what's happened to cable? A lot less people subscribing to cable. A lot more people getting internet access to cable. I mean, it's an interesting, you know, you add value or you become a commodity. And this is a cruel lesson that I sometimes call a digital Darwinism. Right? Basically, if you are a commodity, you'll be kicked out. If you can dis be dispensed with, you will be dispensed. That's because it's so fr frictionless. Right? So figuring out what that means, I think it's really a way forward. Look what Tesla did about this, the car company. I think they just launched in Brazil, right? I want to buy one, but it's just a slightly buff above my pay grade. But, but uh, <laughs> Tesla said, you know what? The reason to buy this car is cool, and it's using a computer, a tablet, to control the car. This is the added value. I mean, it's something that people love to, to play with this, and you know, this is one of those examples that really does it. Reliance Telecom in India, you know what they say? They say, if you use us, WhatsApp and Facebook is free. And uh, WhatsApp is free anyway, but they do it in some way that it's quicker and easier. So they do the opposite. Spotify, the music service, is free in Sweden and in Denmark, bundled into the telecom, adding value. So I only use the Nike commercial that they have here and say, okay, find your greatness, but please find your converged greatness. <laughs> Not your own greatness. It's easy to find your own greatness. I'm an expert in that. But about converged greatness, about what you do with others, I think this is where the new thing comes in. The thing formerly known as television. Huge in Brazil, obviously. Where is that going? Well, it's converging. It's converging with telecom. I call this broadcasting meets broadbanding. And we're in the epicenter of broadbanding here, right? But what does that mean? There's new fantastic business opportunities of collaboration between the two and, of course, of uh, food chain conflict, of advertising money, disembodiment of media that we're going to see, everything moving into digital culture, like we have with digital textbooks. Everything about ownership to access. If you're in the media business, you know that everything is moving to a click. The song you use to download or get a CD, now it's just a click. Right? The, the book that you want to read is just a click. So that's a really powerful business model, I think, that will require quite a bit of convergence. And, and of course, we talked about that earlier. The real elephant in the room is mobile internet. Hard to believe in this country, because right now there's only 10% of Brazilians using the mobile internet because of connectivity problems. But in many countries, in the next three to five years, 50% of internet access will be mobile. And I would think that Brazil is going to catch up on that too. And it looks to me like all the trends are going in that, that direction of where this will be happening. Then we have this, this shift you know, in terms of power, consumer power. Um, and I call this a shift from buyer beware to seller beware. The buyer used to control all the components of interaction and transaction. It's now the seller that controls this. And this is really for if you sell hardware and devices, you know, this is obviously a tough future, as we can see here, with people connecting how much they use social media to find things. Brazil becoming the number five advertising market in the world. I think this is actually from 2012, because Brazil is already number three <laughs> worldwide, surpassed this. The traffic share and trends, you know, as, you, as we can see earlier in terms of mobile and tablets, that's quite obvious comes down to this one thing, user control. You stand in the way of user control, you don't want to be there. It's about user empowerment. Jeff Bezos from Amazon has one motto that he approaches everything with, and that is really quite simple, customer delight. That's it. When they launched movies, they gave 7,000 free movies, HD streaming, to all of the users in the US that were premium customers for free, so that they would get, be delighted about the new offering. Can you give a present to your customers? Ask yourself that question when you go home today. What present can you give your customers? 
to get them to be delighted and stay with you. That's the key. I think I have to come to the end pretty soon. I right? <laughs> just keep going here. But uh, this idea of captive customers is the past. We really have to think about what that means for telecom and technology. And I think this is something, you know, this uh, consumer empowerment is something that we see on a global ca scale. I call this the people formerly known as consumers. And we know that from our own selves. We're very happy to be people formerly known as consumers. But as businesses, you know, this is the question I have. Are you ready to serve? To serve. Right? This question, of course, also goes for politicians. Right? Are you ready to serve or are you ready to control? You know, if you're ready to control, you, you, you can leave. Because it won't work. There are some people getting away with that, right? but it's hard. So it's about ready to serve. Everything is becoming intelligent around us. Street signs, intelligent objects, roads, us. Yeah. Our brain is becoming outsourced to the mobile. Right? From mobile devices are our second brain. As you can see in this uh, cartoon here, is we think we control them, but they really do control us in the end, asking for, you know, to be sharing something or twittering something or to being charged. <laughs> so you have to wonder what Bob's being next. I think we will need some balance on this. It would be nice to have some balance on this. I'll talk about big data and then I'll summarize and I'll get off the stage. Big data you see in the newspapers every single day now. Big data basically means everything that we already have in the past, the data that we share, you know, where we are, our browsing history, our location, hugely exponential, uh, data being the new oil, which quite literally, and this is very important for Brazil, I think, data is going to be more of an economic force than fossil fuel. Because everything that we do generates data, and data is being used everywhere. And of course, Google and others are in the data business, and the data mining and usage business, also very important for advertising. So let's define big data as an exponential growth of value, variety, volume, and velocity. And today we're down here with our data use, and we already think it's quite scary. Give it five years, it's going to be exponential. We're talking exponential means every 18 months doubling. So the amount of information available. That will take quite a bit of responsibility, and what I call uh, big intelligence, big opportunities, for example, marketing and advertising will completely be changed upside down by data. And that's already happening, including, of course, prediction. Prediction is really a, it's going to be a way of life in the, in the very near future. So I can predict what you're going to buy based on your, on your patterns. It's just a question of being there in the right time. And that could also you know, have some interesting side effects, but uh, for example, as we see the internet becoming sort of a, a huge uh, uh, ocean of content, we'll have to figure out what to do about this and without being sucked into the digital funnel. And once you get everybody connected in Brazil, the next step is to figure out how to disconnect them so they can have some peace of mind sometimes. I think this is part of the natural process. So uh, I would appeal to you also, if you're in the tech business, data and privacy regulation is absolutely crucial. We don't want our brain to get connected to international huge pipelines without any permission or any recourse. Right? And that's basically what's happening. So we have to look at this. I think this is a crucial topic. Uh, as you can see right now here is that people are already saying the US cloud computing industry may lose something like $35 billion because of the privacy issues. Recently discussed. No need to get into, but also an interesting opportunity in Brazil. We don't want this world. right? just because we're on the internet. And I would propose to you as technology companies and telecom companies, you have to make sure there's a balance, because otherwise people are worried. And we see this happening around us. I think this is a big mission also to, to look at. Because with great power comes great responsibility. And you have, as tech companies, tremendous power over our lives. I mean, this is addictive stuff. This is better than fill in the blank. Okay, fill in the YouTube censorship. But Voltaire said this, we have great responsibility right, with this. And this is really, I think, also important for business models. So uh, talk about advertising, then I'll really get off the stage. Old kind of advertising was based on lies, yelling, the water can, interruption, noise. And it worked. 
despite all of that. But future advertising in the age of digital is going to look like this, right? Finding a door into people's mind. And not just the mind, but the heart. I mean, mind is one thing, but people don't buy things because of stats. Right? They love things, they buy them, right? So you want to look for advertising in the future, it's about that. How do you find the door to people's minds and hearts? Right? How, do you, how do you become a magnet? Right? How do you become attractive? That people will buy you over somebody else. And most of that will be social, local, mobile. You know, solo mo, as people say. Great opportunity, I think, for the future. So the question I have for you, are you ready? Are you ready for this future? If you're not ready, don't worry. You can be ready tomorrow. Right? Just have a mental shift, and I'll give you a couple hints, and then, uh, you know, first, don't be an empire. Empires are Roman. Empires are not going to work here. Be a network. You can be a big wheel in this global brain, right? but you can't be the brain, except for maybe one or two companies that have tried, and are still trying. Okay, a summary. Point one. The digital default requires rethinking. Think of the world in a digital way. That is a different world, requires transformation. Think about what you want to be in five years. Move up and across the food chain. If you're a telecom company, you've got to think about content. If you're a device maker, you've got to think about advertising. Right? If you're a media company, you have to think about technology. Old logic is deadly. If you use yesterday's logic to come up with tomorrow's business plan, you will certainly fail. And I mean, this is obvious all around us here. Right? In, for example, in the publishing business, what's happening, the old logic, you know, basically making it scars when it's not, won't work. Media is moving from ownership to access. Social, local, mobile, cloud, video. That's it. You can pray that tonight, social, local, clo uh, social, local mobile, cloud, video, <laughs> and you have a good summary of the day. Okay. Data is the new oil. And we're all in the data business now, in one way or the other. This is also something to be very careful about. Trust and technology are intertwined. If you're in the tech business, you're in the trust business. Nobody will buy or use your stuff without trust. Keep that in mind. It's not about how cool it is. That only works for a week. After that, it's about trust. And adding new values. But uh, I, I did skip the beginning from my favorite author here in Brazil, Paolo Coelho, who says, Sometimes happiness is a blessing, but normally it's a conquest. Okay, so I think you have to look at this as a conquest. Thanks very much for your time, and I wish you a good day. And please feel free to tweet or, or do whatever to reach me and go to my cloud to pick up my stuff if you like. Thanks very much.